My name is Roger Cohn. I'm editor of Yale Environment Online, which is a new environmental online magazine that's being launched by Yale University. And I'm honored to be home in Berkeley again and to be um, moderating this panel today on uh, focus, which focuses on uh, disease and the environment, tracing invisible threats, disease and the environment. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel and I will do my best to be as efficient and ruthless as Orville Schell was this morning in keeping everybody on track. Um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, looking at this conference and what's, what's, gonna, what's happening here over these days, uh, th having a panel here where we're going to look at these environmental uh, issues through the lens of health, I think, is um, rather than through, the, through a, a more traditional environmental lens, I think uh, is a very interesting and fascinating aspect and important aspect of the issues we're looking at. Uh, we'll have each speaker speak for about 20 minutes, uh, give some time afterwards. We should have some time if the speakers want to interact with each other a little bit and then uh, still have time for questions from the audience. Uh, our first speaker is from right here at Berkeley, Kirk Smith. Kirk is a professor of environmental health sciences and he holds the Maxwell Endowed Chair in Public Health here at UC Berkeley. He's also founder and coordinator of the campus-wide master's program in health, environment, and development. He he's, has research work that is, focuses on environmental health issues in developing countries, particularly those related to health damaging and climate changing air pollution. And uh, this includes ongoing field projects in China, as well as in India, Mexico, and Guatemala. Uh, in 1970, 1997, Kirk was elected a member of the U U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he was elected by his peers, and this is one of the highest honors awarded to American scientists. So uh, I'd like to introduce Kirk. He's going to be speaking on, on um, energy and climate connections for China's environmental health challenges. Uh, Kirk Smith. Let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, okay, great. So I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, it's an extremely exciting subject for all of us, yeah. vital to many of us. Um, I put in here, oh, it's not showing the Chinese. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess the Chinese, the reach of the Chinese government is very long. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But in any case, um, I told my mother I got the Nobel Prize this last week, uh, this last <laughs> fall. But for you, I had to put in, you know, that was only at the 0.03% uh, level, <laughs> sharing it with a number of other people in this room and 2,000 scientists in the IPCC, of course. Um, so I want to um, uh, tell you what I'm going to say. I'm going to talk about how important are environmental risk factors for health in China. Now, this is quite different than most of the discussion you've heard and are likely to hear, except perhaps in this session. Things look very different when you look at it, how important are environmental risk factors for health than the other way around, how important is health for controlling the environmental risk factors. And you get a very different picture of what's important, the scale of the problems, who's affected, when you look at it in the context of how it actually affects the health of the Chinese population. Um, what are health metrics can be used to do this? Talked a lot about data this morning. Well, the data is quite important in the health field, too. Uh, often we're kind of um, clumsy and, and unsophisticated when we talk about uh, data in somebody else's field. Um, but then the health field has been trying to come up to speed to have very definite definitions of quality control and so forth, just like the environmental sciences. How do these environmental risk factors compare to one another and to other important risk factors in China, for example, smoking and poor nutrition? How do environmental risks tend to change as countries develop? 
Uh, do some rise and some fall? Uh, how does climate change affect these things? And of course, where does China fall in all of these uh, trends? All right, so I want to say we need a metric to talk about here. What is health? Well, the World Health Organization addressed this the very first thing they did when they were created. With this definition, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Well, it's hard to argue with that, but it doesn't operationalize very well. There's no metric obvious here, so it's not helpful. Um, actually, spiritual was added later. That makes it even less helpful. Um, <laughs> so what do the environmental health people do? What are the kinds of things you've heard about when you're thinking about air pollution and water pollution and so on? Well, if you look through the literature and you hear people discuss it, you'll see all sorts of things. I just picked a few from outdoor air pollution. People talk about asthma attacks, missing work days, missing school days, days with cough, emergency room visits, hospital admissions, physician visits. You go down the list, hundreds or at least many dozens of different things. Obviously, these are all related to health in some fashion, but they are arbitrary and local metrics. Very difficult to compare across time, cities, countries, age groups, sectors, say transport versus power plants and so forth. Almost useless, in fact. Um, let alone compare to things that are completely different kinds of risk factors, such as water pollution, lead exposure, high cholesterol, unsafe sex, and so forth. You need metrics that are comparable, compatible, systematically derived across all risk factors, diseases, health endpoints including injuries, non-fatal outcomes, mortality, and so on. What can you use? Well, I don't want to go into this in great detail, but the only thing that anybody's ever come up with is some measure of lost time. The idea that everybody shares the same potential lifespan, and the degree you don't live to it, up to that is a measure of the, your, your ill health, and can use for non-fatal outcomes by weighting the, by se the severity of the outcome. If it's one disease versus another disease, how long do you have it? How severe is it? The particular unit I'm using is called the DALI, a Disability Adjusted Life Year. And its principles are the only differences in the rating of a death or disability, illness or injury, should be due to age and sex, not income, culture, location, or social class. So that means the beggar in Dhaka, Bangladesh, who dies at age 60, the male beggar, counts the same as the male billionaire dying in the Mayo Clinic in the US. We don't count income, culture, so forth. Very difficult to operationalize such a thing, but this is an essentially the prime directive of public health is to treat everybody the same, except for age and sex, which are universal human experiences. I worked at the East-West Center for many years, and they had a contest in the population program for t-shirts, and one that hands down won over the years was on the back of the t-shirt, it says, broken down by age and sex. And everyone in the world has the right to the best life expectancy. So the, the index is a very simple one in, 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 at this level. Years of life lost due to premature mortality and years lost to disability due to injury or illness. You just added them up, and that's the total lost life years due to some disease or activity, let's say, you know, uh, the transport sector or whatever. So that's the unit I'm using. Um, in addition, you need a, what I call a C4 database, and that is it's got to be combined, so you have a lost life year. It's got to be complete. It's got to include all the populations in the world. It's got to be consistent definitions of all the disease states. And of course, it has to be coherent. The simple thing of having the deaths add up, the columns and rows add up in a spreadsheet. The health field hasn't had that until quite recently. In the energy field, where I started my career, of course, if we found that the energy export statistics did not match the energy import statistics, we'd send the analysts back and say, you know, go fix this. But for generations, we didn't have health statistics that added up the rows and columns. And it was a big effort, actually, to accomplish this. This is what one of the databases looks like. It's a huge thing, goes way down here, goes way over here. This is males, ages, diseases. This is for the whole world, but they have these for you know, countries, parts of the world, and so on. It's a database maintained by the WHO. It is a coherent, systematic C4 database, finally. So now we can do the kind of analyses we're used to doing in energy and finances and demography and food and all the other important things in life we can now do with health. So what kind of things can we do? Well, let's look at China here. Here's annual, this is the lost healthy life days per capita, just multiplied by 365. Here you can see a set of parts of the world. Here's China. 
And you can see that very young children are very unhealthy. That is, there's a lot of risk in young children, particularly in poor parts of the world. But even in our part of the world, young children bear a greater burden of the disease. And as you get older, of course, people, there's more risk involved in every country. But China, if you hadn't known already, it's better to be rich than poor. And you can see the rich are better off at every level. China is not poor, it's not rich, it's a middle income country, has the characteristics of a middle income country. A ways to go on child health and all along the way, but not nearly as bad off as India or sub-Saharan Africa or somewhere. The burden of disease in China in its simplest form, what are the things that cause the most lost life years? Cancer, about 8%. Depression, the mental illness. Stroke, perinatal effects affecting very young children. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. China has the highest rates of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in the world. Um, acute lower respiratory infections, mainly kills young children, road traffic accidents, ischemic heart disease. This is you know, the kind you think of when you think of heart disease. And a whole bunch of other things. These are just 2%. So in a sense, these are the targets for improving the health of China. So our question is, how much do environmental risk factors, how important are they for these and, and, and the others that I haven't shown here? Well, a big study was done, a uh, big global assessment, you know, not at the scale of the IPCC, but that sort of thing, a uh, very big effort organized by WHO to try to do these calculations. Disease, injury, and death due to major risk factors calculated by age, sex, and 14 regions, published in 2004, now being updated. Um, here are the risk factors examined. Here are the environmental ones, lead exposure, water hygiene, sanitation, climate change, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, and a range of environmental risk factors plus a range of other things, uh, non-environmental risk factors. Um, now, let me back up a bit um, before I get into the results of this for China, because you may be surprised by them. I didn't hear a particular word this morning. I may have missed it, but I didn't. certainly wasn't often mentioned, and that's this word. In fact, China is still a rural country. It will be a rural country for at least another 20 years, perhaps longer. And even then, it'll still be half rural. I didn't hear much about the environmental health problems or any problems in rural areas, and yet that is where the real problems of China lie, and that's something I want to try to convince you. Uh, let's take energy. Well, the total energy use in rural areas is dominated by these solid fuels, and if you look at households, it's dominated by biomass fuels. So it's true to say in China, as it is to say in most of the world, that most of the people rely for most of their energy on simple biomass fuels. A situation that hasn't changed since the discovery of, or the conquering of fire a million years ago. So this is the reality of life and energy for most of China's population. It's a very complicated situation. I've spent many years doing measurements in, in, these, in, in China, but here's a typical situation. She's, she's got coal, she's got straw, she's got wood, she uses it according to the kind of cooking she has, the season, you know, what's happening, who's there to help her, all sorts of things. Very complex situation. We don't understand it completely, but you can see all of these are heavily polluting fuels. They burn very poorly in these simple little stoves. Coal, perhaps the worst, but these things are not so good either. And consequently, you get very heavy pollution exposures from this kind of open, uh, you know, cooking. Now, Am I saying it's nasty stuff? Is that, am I exaggerating? No. This is the pollutants in typical biomass or coal smoke, leaving aside the contaminants that might be in the coal, like sulfur, arsenic, fluorine, lead, mercury, which exists in Chinese coal. Just the things that are created in both kinds of fuel from incomplete combustion. A whole range of nasty things. We heard about benzene this morning. You hear about formaldehyde. You hear about uh, benzopyrene or polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, some of these other pollutants. Dioxin. The actual largest exposures to these things are in rural households, not in the modern sector. Now, you're, I mean, a spill of benzene in a river, obviously, is a very important thing that has to be dealt with. But day in, day out, a large population doing a very polluting activity right under their noses is a, you can't have a bigger exposure, uh, prescription for a high exposure than that. Uh, so what do we know? Well, um, so supposed to be, how do we know, what do we know? I can't go through this. There, we've done, uh, recently published a, a review of this, if you're interested. And uh, a lot of studies have been done on the health effects of, study, uh, of these exposures. These are 
fairly sophisticated biomedical studies using you know modern techniques with good statistical analysis and this kind of thing. This is a uh, meta-analysis, so-called, that we did combine the results of many studies, about 20 different studies. And how you read this is that basically it says, women who live in households using coal have about two times the lung cancer risk of women who live in households using cleaner fuels. Um, this is why women in China have the highest lung cancer rates in the world for non-smokers. It's because of this heavy indoor exposure to pollutants that, you know, in some ways is as old as time. Other kinds of studies, respiratory illness, uh, you know, I don't, we don't have time to go into this. These ones in red, it means statistically significant results of studies looking at the effect of different kinds of pollutants. Here is uh, other kinds of outcomes. Um, again, for this is school-aged children. Um, dozens of these kinds of things. In addition, you know, doing correlations is one kind of evidence, but a much more convincing kind of evidence is interventions. Do you see an actual health improvement? Well, China has the best studies in the world of showing a health improvement when you do something beneficial in the rural energy sector. And um, this is um, improved stoves that were put in in uh, Yunnan uh, province, in the county of Yunnan province. Air pollution levels went down by three. The reduction in lung cancer by 40 percent, published in the National Journal of the National Cancer Institute, reduction of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, similar level 50 percent. These are the best evidence we have. We know you can get a benefit. We know you can have an impact on these two, at least these two big diseases, and we expect a range of others from Chinese data. What kind of other diseases? Well, we have data actually about a vast range of things. Um, here I mentioned chronic obstructive lung disease and lung cancer, but also pneumonia in young children and lesser levels of evidence, but still multiple studies of each of these other things. I just came back from China and colleagues there have now found cognitive effects in children, that is learning disability in children who are exposed to indoor air pollution from these fuels. It's not surprising, it's a lot of nasty stuff, high CO levels. We see it in other kinds of um, exposures. Not surprising we would see it in children from these exposures. Uh, we are now starting to see heart disease, and not even on this list is a, a recent study done in China by colleagues at Beida showing uh, birth defects from exposure. There are very high rates of birth defects in rural China, these like neural tube deficiencies and this kind of thing in, in, uh, you know, in babies. These things have to be published, peer reviewed, and so on before we can see exactly how good they are, but it, we're, you know, the, the evidence base is growing. Um, all right, I'm going to skip this. We think that COPD yeah, and uh, pneumonia are the biggest effects. Here is the world use of household fuels, China intermediate compared to India and Sub-Saharan Africa. What about outdoor air pollution, another effect that we hear about? Well, the same set of studies uh, developed a model using real data plus modeling data to predict the, high, the levels of particle pollution in cities. You can see the dirtiest parts of the world are northern China, northern India, and surprising actually, the Near East. So, if you look at the distribution, here's the distribution of particles in Chinese cities, and uh, uh, so about 50% 50 50 of the cities have, uh, you know, less, uh, 110 or more, 110 or less, similar to India. You notice that the cleanest Chinese cities barely overlap with the dirtiest of the American cities. Not surprising for those of you who've been there. The results of the of the, uh, the comparative risk assessment shows on a global basis the Dalis, the large Dipiers, dominated by China and India and the Near East. So that's where the ill health from outdoor air pollution is. All right, so what are the, I'm going to skip the global one, let's look at the global burden of disease from uh, the top, these top 10 risk factors. You can see indoor air pollution here is the most important, well, occupational hazards and then indoor air pollution the most important of the environmental risk factors in China. Here's outdoor. Now that's down the list a bit, but it's still a rather significant impact in terms of premature mortality. Not as big, however, as what's estimated for the indoor air pollution, something on the uh, close to 400,000 premature deaths. Now, some of you mentioned, you know the World Bank study that came out jointly with CEPA last summer, uh, calculating the economic burden from ill health, from environmental impact risk factors in China. At the last minute, two weeks before it was due to be published, SEPA took out the chapter on indoor air. So only showing this for outdoor air pollution. In fact, the summary tables didn't even catch up with it. Summary still show indoor air. 
but that chapter on indoor air is gone. Now, why exactly SEPA felt that they needed to take it out? There was no technical criticism. It's been peer reviewed like everything else. Uh, we can perhaps talk about afterwards, but it's not well accepted as a risk factor in China. All right, I'm going to skip some of this stuff since I'm running out of time. The environmental risk transition framework is the idea that there's a set of the risk factors that tend to evolve with economic development, household level risk factors like indoor air pollution, pool water, and sanitation. There's a set of modern risk factors that tend to rise and then fall with economic development, things like urban pollution. And if you use these databases that I mentioned, you can actually, for the first time, provide an empirical test to this, and you can see that household risks do tend to decline with development. Here's indoor air pollution, unsafe water, lack of malaria control. They do, this is purchasing power per capita. This is regions of the world, and you can see they do tend to decline. Here's the total log scale notice. Community risks do tend to rise and then fall. Community risks are lead exposure, occupational impacts, road traffic accidents, and urban air pollution. So that kind of sometimes called the Kuznets curve, but it only applies to these community urban level pollutants. Not everything goes in this pattern, I'm gonna skip those. Now, I want to end a little bit on climate change, because that's uh, you know, so topical these days. The climate change is here. It's a very small fraction in, in the global burden of disease, even smaller in China. We wouldn't care about it, except, of course, if it's growing, unlike some of these others. So we think it might get very big. If you look at the distribution of the mortality from climate change estimated, you can see it's dominated by the poor parts of the world. India, sub-Saharan Africa, U.S. is not getting much impact from climate change. China is getting some, um, South America not much. But now what about the responsibility? Who's put in those greenhouse gases? Well, you know, there are various responsibility measures. We've just done a new one, where we've, I think it's the first time actually concluded both CO2 and methane, because methane is actually a quite powerful greenhouse gas and often left off of discussions. And you can see that you, uh, those of you who are Americans, we have about 170 tons of carbon in the atmosphere in our names based on the operation of the U.S. economy in the past, the pollutants it's put in minus what's come out naturally, while the average Chinese has about 21 tons by this measurement. So this is the inequity in the world that they, we put in most of it, and they are putting in some, but uh, got a long way to go before they catch up with us. Of course, they're a big place, so in total it's a lot of pollution, but on a responsibility basis, it is uh, still a long way to go. So if you look at it, that map on a responsibility basis, you see the U.S. dominates. Doesn't get much of the impact, but it gets a lot of the responsibility. China is still there. India is down a bit. So if you calculate these impacts, if you look at the distribution per capita, and these are the people experiencing the risk. So poor countries, poor countries get a lot of risk. Rich countries don't get a lot of risk. But those imposing the risk Poor countries don't impose much, uh, and rich countries do. Experiencing climate change and imposing climate change risk. It's the same total in each case, just distributed differently. There's China. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at the ratio. So this says the rich countries impose 500 times more risk than they receive. Poor countries receive 16 times more help than they impose. So this is, you might call, uh, you know, the 8,000 times different, one of the big inequity ratios in the world. Um, now, where does China sit? It's not either a rich country or a poor country. Has, has China crossed the transition? Is it imposing more risk on the world than it's receiving? No, I'm just talking about health risk now. Or is it still, you know, a victim? Well, it turns out it's actually imposing more than it's receiving. So in that, from, by that measure, China has crossed the responsibility threshold of putting out more impact on the world in terms of health from climate change. All right, I'm gonna skip this stuff and go to my bottom line. China is mostly rural, will be for decades more. If you're interested in environmental health, rural populations are at most risk. If you're interested in energy efficiency, rural energy systems are least efficient in the country. I think I can say by far. If you're interested in climate change, rural energy systems have the most greenhouse gas emissions per unit useful energy. Not total, but per unit useful energy, and not a small fraction of the total. 
You may know that China has the largest in income inequity in, China, in Asia now. The ratio uh, between the richest 10% and the poorest is about 20. You know, worse than the Philippines, if you can believe it. This is a direct measure of the rural urban, in, urban income gap, or the rural urban gap in the country of various sorts. So, my last thing, if you are interested in development, it is rural areas that most need it. So I'm going to skip this. So uh, uh, thank you, collaborators at various Chinese institutions over the years. And if you're interested in, um, here is some of the publications that uh, these uh, numbers were derived from. And you can get recent publications. And um, you can get all of those oops, on my website. So thank you very much. on me. Our next speaker is going to emerge from the audience. Uh, Peng Gong is a professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his Bachelor of Science in Geography at Nanjing University in China in 1984 and his PhD in Geography from the University of Waterloo in Canada in 1990. He's also the director of CAMPHER which is the Center for the Assessment and Monitoring of Forest and Environmental Resources. And he's involved in some very interesting projects in China, where he has developed an NGO uh, known by the acronym CHANGES, which is in Beijing, uh, which is a high-level advisory board dealing with issues relating to the environment and climate change. And he's also building an environment and health ecological research station at Poyang Lake in China. So, Be, uh, Peng Gong. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I really enjoyed the talk in the morning and also Kirk's talk in the afternoon. <clears throat> so, um, I came uh, prepared with some really detailed, I, I tried to tell stories about uh, how I became involved in working in China. Actually, Bob Spear, who is sitting, who is going to make the presentation later, he took me to China to work in China on the research side 12 years ago. But after I listened to the talks in the morning, I decided to change the whole storyteller style and Instead, I'm going to just present uh, three things. Um, of course, I will use some our own examples to illustrate the kind of work that, uh, why it's important for what we do here. Uh, the first is going to be environmental data collection and uh, production at the national level. We're, we, are, we are here to ask for where the data, data are, so I can provide some uh, um, help on the environmental side. Uh, not really the simple environmental, you know, chemical. It's really the ecosystem environment. Then uh, I'll talk a little bit about Poyang Lake Environment and Health Ecological Research Station. That's a grassroots type of activity that uh, we're doing in China. And then I'll introduce a little bit about changes. Um, I'd like to start with this one. Uh, when I go to China, we work on the uh, water-related uh, problems, health research. And I try to get a map of the entire China on the wetland distribution. Uh, I couldn't get it. It doesn't exist. So it could be partially available from here and there. So I said, if we don't have it, we'll make it. So from our, from our field, we can prepare the data using remote sensing. So this is the first product of wetland distribution of the entire China, which is actually produced yesterday by one of my colleagues. It took us about half a year to get this done. So uh, 
in terms of the environmental data on the ecosystem level, uh, we are all aware that some of the climate data is relatively easy to access. Soil data, actually, because of the pollution, they change so much. Um, but some static soil data from the 1986 soil survey is available in China, and we have access to that. Land cover and land use, there are data in the 1980s for the whole, I'm talking about the national level. And also in the 1990s, 1995, year 2000. But they are not produced for year 2005 at the one to 100,000 scale level. And uh, of course, there are lots of remote sensing data. I talked about the wetland map. They are made from the year 2000 series um, Landsat imagery. So uh, I'd like to um, share with colleagues here is that we have access to lots of remotely sensed data over China. This is partly for Poyang Lake, which is a lake south of the north is Yangtze River. And south of Yangtze River, it's a seasonal lake. In the winter, it could be just like just a river. And in the summer, it's swelled by water. Could reach to about 5,000 square kilometers, the largest freshwater lake in China. And also, you know, we have very intensive study about this area. It's one of 10 um, world winter wild bird ha uh, habitat. Um, this is a, a little map we, we do from our field that to make uh, the water coverage in a year. You know, how many days the land are going to be exposed to water or vice versa. It's, it's you know, emerging from the water kind of thing. Uh, these are the terrain maps. Uh, it's interesting that Kirk is talking about rural areas because I'm going to show you a little bit about the, some data that we are collecting about China's rural development on the build-up side. If you look at China's plain, you know, the relatively flat area, under 100 meter, you know, at the Three Gorges area, right under the dam, it is 60 meter, okay? So the green, the total green, is going to be the areas in China that are under 100 meter above sea level and also less than three degrees. And it is less than 950,000 square kilometer, less than one-tenth of China's territory. And uh, it holds for almost 60% of China's population. So you can imagine why problems are, are serious in, in, this, in, in China. Be, you know, in the morning, people are comment about the resource uh, lack, lackness in China. There are lots of things we could develop from this. Uh, for example, in relatively flat area, it's very easy for remote sensing to monitor those areas, to, to map those areas. It's the most problematic area also. So, you know, we could derive all sort of data for those areas. We talk about Three Gorges Dam in the morning. I just pulled out some uh, uh, imagery. Basically, here is a dam. This is what is called the uh, um, Xiangxi River. This is in 1987. This is in 19, uh, year 2002. This is year 2006. The green colors are the natural land. This area has a huge relief. You could reach for more than 30 degrees of slope. From 60 meters, you can go to about 1,500 meters in elevation. In this area, in the old, it's been, you know, there are all sorts of beautiful poems in Chinese, you know, talking about how wild it is. North of this area, by just about 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers, is Da Shen Nongjia, which is still, you know, people are talking about there are wild men in that area. 
And also, you, you hear about recently the tiger. You know, whether or not there's the Huanan, you know, the one, one subspecies of tiger in, in, in China. Actually, it's right north to this area. And one of my colleagues, my student, I took him to, to this area. Actually, we went to this area um, two year, uh, almost three years ago in, in January. It's a very challenging area. Anyway, I'm just trying to explain. Look at how much change there has in four years. I have some things, you know, you don't see Chinese. This is for urban China's state statistics about China's urban development on each year in terms of land build up area. This is annual from 1978 after the open door. The rural development. See how huge the rural area has been expanding compared to the urban area. Now China has just exceeded 40% of urbanization. And there are still you know, less than 60% of Chinese rural people. There are a series of environmental problems due to build up and also due to reclamation. You know, people, they build land for construction, then they need to go and try to find spaces to make it up. Okay, to, to make more arable land available. So uh, population change, migration, also economic drivers making lots of change. Look at here, Per River Delta, the richest area of China. This is in 1990, and this is uh, year 2004. The red area is built up. It's solid concrete and roofs, those kind of things. Look at the, the percentage change. So the reason I show you on the flat area is I'd like to share with you on the flat area, we did a study. Don't, you know, again, it's because of this, the system. So you don't have Chinese. All I want to show you is these are six, six counties on the northern China plain, flat area. If you fly, ever fly over that area on the airplane, you see on the land, you know, lots of rural residents. You know, the, the government report is telling you by year 2006, these are the percentages of build up area in those counties. And with remote sensing of year 2006, you can find the build up area is double than the state report. This includes the urban and also the rural area, just the build up area in, in China. So when we say how certain we are about certain data that are being provided from different levels, I gave you a concrete example. I can show you that our accuracy is very high on, on the land development. So that's the data part. How many minutes do I have? You have uh, 10 more minutes. OK, great. So the second part I want to, to share with you is Poyang Lake Environment and Health Ecological Research Station. It's an idea that just came up uh, to me for about over, slightly over than a year. I'm that type of person. When, we decide, when I decide something, I'll just go for it. Even I die for it. So we decided to build this, this, this land is because I work with uh, Bob Spear in the uh, mountain area for studying the schistomyces disease. In China, two out of the 10 provinces having schistomyces disease are mountainous area, Yunnan and Sichuan. So I work with Bob in the Sichuan province in the high mountain area for many years. Then we developed models. At the beginning, when I in, in, uh, became involved with, with Bob, is to help on the GIS, database development, help a little bit on the remote sensing side, and then help a little bit with the GPS side. And then I get to learn from them about their temporal models, you know, dynamic models. And then later we realize that GIS and remote sensing could be fused into those kind of models to build a fully functioning spatial temporal model, not just 
dynamic temporal models. So after that stage, we need to scale it up and scale it down and go to different places. So our strategy is to change, to expand from mountain to the lake areas. So we selected Poyang Lake. So after uh, about a year's time, we surrounded this lake, you know, all, all the areas, basically, to visit different places. And it happened to us in the, in the, in the area that we find it would be really ideal to do a series of uh, more scientific research over there. So this is a, the study site that we, we choose on the eastern edge of the Poyang Lake at the bottleneck region. In the summer, the water is, is basically covering the big marshland. In the winter, the marshland is it's about five square kilometers of marshland that can come out. So this is year 2005, October. We went there the first time. In the schistomyces uh, cycle, there's the only intermediate host, which is uh, snails. So these little, these are not stones from the back. When you look at them, from a quarter square meter, you can find more than 100 snails okay, in there, and there's a marshland. Those intermediate host is a problem. You know, they can carry the disease, help propagate, help transmit the disease. So after so many field trips going to Poyang Lake that drive us to, to look for a series of scientific questions which may not be so important for me to read them out uh, over here. So that drive us to think we need to build a stationed uh, research mechanism there rather than we go there you know, once or twice a year. We need to do that on a weekly basis. So that's basically led us to, to go that area. So December the 1st, no, no, December 31st, year 2006, we went to this place. After one year of negotiation, we purchased slightly over one hectare of land. We're going to build a environmental research stations there, ecological research stations there. This is year 2007, about 30 some hours ago. Just came from, uh, from China. I, I did, I, I'm not there. This is a provincial, Jiangxi province, a provincial leader. You know, he was aware that I, he's helping me to build this uh, experimental station there. He went to that county he insisted to go to see the site, accompanied by the county leader to see the site. He's standing right on top of, we are standing right on, to on top of the land, okay, at different times of that station. So why am I saying so much about this station? Is that this, you know, when you try to do research, you really need to be there. When you try to be there, you need the facilities and all sorts of things. You need to plan for it. You need to build a station from dream to reality. I need help. So anyone who in the audience can help me, <laughs> yeah. I cannot do it myself. It takes probably not a lot of money, but it's, you know, in, in American standard, but it's, it's still something, yeah. Okay, so what are, are we going to do uh, facility-wise? We'll have bird observatories, locations. These are towers. We want to use the wireless sensor network technology to monitor both the water and also the marshland ecosystem and also the water quality. You know, it's, so it's being planned for that. So we need site is selected. We need to build the facilities. And last, I'd like to briefly introduce Change, which is, a, which is an NGO built one year ago in China, in Beijing. I don't really have much time, as our moderator is showing me. This is, this is a place you could go and take a look at what, what we do there. It's 
called gochange.org because change has been registered ahead of us. We thought Go Change is better. <laughs> I won't spend more time on you know why there we, we believe there is a need, there is a gap for building this change. But the the mission I could share with you right over here is basically to enhance global sustainability by supporting environmental decision making, to reduce China's environmental impacts, and to improve China's adaptive capacity. So there are some areas of uh, emphasis of this, and we have some challenges. We have some thoughtful projects, which also need some, some help. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Peng. Uh, next speaker, uh, the man who's worked with Peng, uh, Peng has worked with, Dr. Robert Speer, who's here at Berkeley at the School of Public Health. Dr. Speer's research interests focus on the assessment and quantification of human exposures to toxic and hazardous agents in the environment. And he's currently working on an ongoing project uh, which uh, we just heard a little bit about involving the determinants of the incidence and control of schistomyosis in the mountains regions of Sichuan province. Uh, Dr. Speer received his BS and MS degrees in engineering and science and in mechanical engineering uh, from UC Berkeley and PhD in control engineering from Cambridge University. And after several years, in the aerospace industry, his interests turned to environmental issues, and he returned to Berkeley, which continues to be his home. Dr. Robert Speer. Thank you very much. Uh, since I don't have any slides, I think I can uh, sit right here and speak to you. Uh, as you just heard, uh, I started life as a rocket scientist. and. Uh, <clears throat> and I can tell you that some of the things we deal with today are much more complex than rocket science. So let's go start from there. Um, although it was implicit in much of what Kirk said, I thought I would say just a couple of things about what we mean by environmental health uh, in the public health world. And basically, uh, the epidemiologists, of which we are not they, are people that study the patterns of disease in human populations. And they're generally interested in the associations, either environmental or genetic or whatever they may be, that determine those distributions. But environmental health is, of course, first interested in the environmental part of these determinants of human population health. And moreover, we're interested in doing something about it. That is to say, control and intervention. And control and intervention apply, imply needing to know a good deal more about what causes or the, the determinants of disease than just an association. We need to know causation. We need to know mechanism. And indeed, we need to know these things in some quantitative way because we want to intervene and intervene effectively. So that's why uh, in environmental health, you'll find uh, a representation. Indeed, it's probably in the only place in most schools of public health that you find engineers and physical scientists, which uh, Kirk and I are uh, examples of that. Uh, and it's because we're interested in these mechanisms and intervention and control. And uh, uh, so, it's one thing for us to understand uh, what the environmental determinants uh, of uh, disease in human populations are, and Kirk has certainly given a good overview of the, the new ways in which that's done in a defensible and consistent way. Uh, but then the next issue, of course, is, well, what do we do about it? Um, and 
part of this, I think, uh, I want to make uh, clear that this is a, a sort of experiential discussion in the sense that I'm not a China scholar. I'm somebody who works in China and does research in China, but it is not about China per se. It certainly is about Chinese people in terms of the people we study and, and the people that we hope to uh, improve, whose situation we hope to improve. But in any case, uh, I think that's important uh, uh, to know that uh, I first went to China in 1981 uh, and I was uh, basically invited by uh, Professor uh, Ma Xu, who uh, was at that time the president of Beijing Medical College, and uh, I believe was actually with uh, Chairman Mao on the long march. He certainly went back a long way and had a very much an imperial presence about him. I do remember that. Um, at the time when I first went to China, my work here in the United States had been largely associated with occupational health. The occupational environment is one of, of course, many environments that we're concerned with, and Kirk alluded to it in some of his, uh, some of his data there. And so that was what I thought uh, I might uh, be inv become involved with w in China when I first went uh, and spent a month in, in Beijing in 1981. Um, and I, I think partly because of the fact that I was interested in intervention and control, this was a way too early time for me to be in China because China was certainly not interested at that time in intervention and control of occupational health hazards. Indeed, China was at that time principally an interesting place for scientists to study those hazards and in particular because of the low population mobility. If you're looking at uh, exposure to, car to carcinogens, for example, that have, take a long time between exposure and actual manifestation as clinical disease, you need to have populations that are quite stable. So China was a, a great place to do that. But that really wasn't what I did. I wasn't, uh, I'm not a person who looks particularly at the biology and tries to understand the biology of these diseases. Um, but that certainly was, uh, there was a, an era which uh, began then and is just ending now as population mobility in China gets completely, uh, uh, well, it, at such a level that it, there, there's no longer the possibility of doing the kind of thing one used to do. And some of, but some of my colleagues have actually exemplified those kinds of studies working with Chinese colleagues. Uh, uh, Professor Lu Ping Zhang is here, Martin Smith and uh, Steve Rappaport, my colleagues have had a long on st ongoing study with NCI and the Occupational uh, Health um, uh, Institute in, in Beijing of uh, benzene-induced leukemia in Chinese workers. And this was a place where you could do that kind of thing. But in any case, uh, uh, it wasn't a place for me partly because of the fact that I uh, uh, I was interested in, in intervention and control, which was a, it was just too early. Um, but I kept going back, uh, and uh, I, I met a lot of people and ate a lot of great Chinese food over the years. Um, and and uh, in meeting a lot of people, I got invited to a meeting in 1992 uh, here in California, at Santa Cruz, down in Chaminade, uh, of Chinese medical leaders and educators, public health people, and uh, at that time, there are American connections. And uh, uh, at that time, I was recruited to work uh, on this disease they referred to as schistosomiasis, which is only important here in the context of the fact that, that, that it's a disease of rural people. And uh, that, that happened, uh, I won't tell the whole story, those of you who know me here have heard it before, but uh, uh, I met, uh, at the coffee break, I met this woman, uh, an older woman, who said, you know, who are you and what do you do, Chinese woman, and I told her. And uh, I told her about a project one of my students was working on about mosquito population dynamics uh, here in California and arboviral disease, one thing and the other. And she said, you ought to apply those ideas to schistosomiasis in China. And I said, uh, I don't know anything about schistosomiasis. And she said, well, you should learn. So I wandered off. <laughs> And I found somebody and I said, you know, who is that lady? 
And her name was Professor Chen Chengming, and I have since heard her refer to her as the Deng Xiaoping of health in China. <laughs> and so whether that's true or not, I can't, uh, can't, can't verify. But uh, when I found out who she was, you know, she ran seven institutes and thousands of scientists, I took her seriously and uh, wrote her back a year later, said, I've taken your advice seriously and I want to follow up. She invited me to come to China and she said, I'll put you in touch with the right people and that happened and I've been working on ever since in rural China uh, on schistosomiasis, which is basically uh, a parasitic disease, which is a chronic disease of poor people, very easily treated, no, very little conferred immunity, reinfection is very common. So. Uh, in the absence of a vaccine, what you do is environmental interventions. And that takes to me to my real subject of the day, which is the manpower subject. It's the fact that once you know what the problem is, uh, and even if you understand what to do about it, you need to have the capacity to do it. And, um, and I found uh, both in my occupational health era, of the first decade I was in China, and since then, when I've been working on, in rural China, on infectious disease, that there's a real manpower capacity issue, which seems to me to go to the root of environmental control and response uh, generally, outside of simply health. Uh, the most graphic example of that, I think, is the a field that uh, in, in the West is called either occupational or industrial hygiene, which is, not a very uh, uh, good title, but uh, the fact of the matter is these people are the ones who, are, who try and maintain a healthy working environment in, in the occupational setting. So in the industrial world is really where they're important. And I, I think it was seven or eight years ago, I had a call from colleagues at IBM who said, uh, we're building this big plant in China and we want to hire some Chinese industrial hygienists. Can you lead us to some? And I said, they don't exist in China. There is no such thing. And there still today is no such thing. Uh, and why is that? Well, my own diagnosis of it is, as you may know, until very recently, the Chinese educational system was bifurcated that the, had anything to do with health was out of the Ministry of Health and in, in, the, in the medical universities and everything else out of education in the, in, the, uh, in the general universities. And that's now been changed, but the residuum of it lives on. And that anybody that had to do with health basically began with a five-year uh, equivalent of the British Bachelor of Medicine degree. And, and these people, of course, had a clinical focus. They did not have an environmental focus. They weren't concerned with the environment and found it very difficult to become interested in that when they found themselves assigned to tasks that related to that. So uh, industrial hygiene is the absolutely quintessential example of a field that really requires chemistry and engineering to basically understand the environmental uh, exposure factors and the potential modifications of the environment to suppress exposure of those factors. But the people in charge are basically clinicians, okay, that get the responsibility. So every school of public health in China has an occupational medicine department that takes care of you when you get it. There's not one whit of prevention in their educational program. And there's nowhere else where you can find that either. And uh, I've been on this, uh, Pung has heard me in the past uh, give this pitch. Uh, and I, uh, several years back, I, I got an award from the Chinese government for longevity, I think, in, in China, in rural China. <laughs> and uh, I, I was asked by uh, someone approached me over my shoulder and said, uh, if I had any advice to give the Chinese government, uh, that Vice Premier Wu Yi would be interested in receiving it. And I wrote her on this subject. I said, you know, you need to do some innovation in the educational system to train a new cadre of people to take care of Chinese workers. And, uh, you know, whether they're in mines or whether they're in factories or wherever they are. And, and, and so that's a real manpower issue. And I don't have to tell many of you here 
that the most important uh, and the most conservative environment in the world is the educational environment. To innovate, to get new programs, interdisciplinary programs, you know, new curricula is extraordinarily difficult. And uh, now there's, I think, widespread recognition in China of the need for this in the trenches manpower. These are not researchers. These are people to work in factories and take care of the workers in all the ways that we know. I mean, there's not a lot of mystery to this, but you've got to do it. And some of it does go on. I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't go on in China, but it's not, there's no trained manpower force. And of course, what that means is the IBMs of this world find ways to take care of this, and the small county level enterprises have nothing. Okay, and that's true the world over. I mean, this is not just a Chinese issue. Uh, the other side of it is that in my work in rural China, I've seen exactly the same thing. That uh, in, in China, in the parasitic, in schistosomiasis, there are these, all the endemic areas have these anti-schistosomiasis stations. And these places both deal with treatment of ill people and pre with prevention. But uh, I was just sh showing uh, Pung this morning uh, uh, a paper that's not brand new, but it was 2004, written by Chinese uh, authors uh, in a Western journal um, that basically documents the fact that as the market economy has come to the health sector, including the rural health sector in China, these uh, stations that were supposed to deal both with treatment and prevention of schistosomiasis have shifted heavily to treatment because they can charge the patient. So now both their costs and their budgets are driven by treatment and prevention has disappeared or is disappearing from their agenda, except insofar as mandates come down from Beijing. And some very creative and, and wide-ranging mandates have come down from the state council about this particular disease, but the capacity is not there at the local level to really respond beyond giving drugs uh, to, to sick people and uh, trying to kill snails with pesticides, which is a very, uh, uh, well, it's never gonna happen. So, I mean, you can kill a lot of them, but they come back very effectively. So, I think the, the message here is that there really is uh, a challenge in, in uh, developing uh, manpower in the trenches. I mean, that's, these are people that are going to work in the county's health departments, are going to work in uh, uh, for companies, for private enterprise, to take care of the environmental health, both the occupational health and, and the rural health, in ways that require interdisciplinary training and a new kind of, uh, of training that uh, has not been present in China. And I venture to guess that what I've experienced in the, in the environmental health world is equally true in other parts of environmental management and control. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spear. I, um, well, I'll just, I'll just start with one question because those of us who don't know too much about the disease, schistosomiasis, um, what can be done, how widespread a problem is it in China, and what can be done um, to, you, you mentioned the difficulties of. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the difficulties of, uh, or uh, the, the limits of. of yeah. yeah. Poisoning snails. What can be done to prevent well, it? Well, uh, China will take China will conquer schistosomiasis because, as I indicated, it's a chronic disease of poor people in poor countries. And as you, as the economy improves, it's not very difficult to deal with this disease. Uh, even if you, well, I give one example. Uh, uh, for many years in China, there's been technology available to put uh, basically what are small anaerobic digesters. Uh, for treating sewage underneath farmhouses. So both where the pig waste and the human waste comes together, you actually uh, uh, treat that in a ana little anaerobic system, which actually generates methane, which can be used for cooking, okay? And so that began to happen when the Chinese government pro prohibited the villagers from collecting wood in the hillsides for erosion control. So all of a sudden, they began to, we could begin to try and sell the biogas digesters, uh, but at the same time, they separate the schistosome eggs 
from the, the human waste in these, in these things and very effectively pr present a, uh, a, a control, not, not the, it's not a panacea, but it's one of the very effective ways it can be done. But you go along now to the county people and you say, you know, this is really a, a, a double whammy. We can, we can get schistosomiasis control and we can get uh, help out the rural energy problems. So you go to the rural energy people and say, we have a village over here that could really benefit from this as far as schistosomiasis is concerned. They said, absolutely, we'll be happy to help, but it's a public health issue, you pay, okay? And that's exactly the issue. It's the, as you all know, the bureaucratic silos in China are as strong as they are anywhere that I've experienced in the world. Um, and so we need to deal with schistosomiasis, which is, as I say, not rocket science even, okay? We need uh, the rural energy people, we need the agriculture people, and we need the health people to work together and to have a unified budget in some fashion to deal with this issue. And uh, that's not there yet. That's not there yet. Uh, I was saying earlier to someone that um, we're now at the point where uh, doing research in China has always been great and we've had all the support. I've never had any trouble getting any data I wanted, but now we're verging on trying to tell them how to do their business and what to do about schistosomiasis in some of these regions. And of course, that's a whole new world and we'll see how far we get. Ready for some questions from the audience? Do, uh, do we have microphones for that? Or, okay. Um, microphone coming down, down here now. Dr. King. Uh, I'm C.S. Kang and uh, from Peking University. I just would like to uh, let everybody know that Peking University at the 2004, we established the Environment Health Research Institute by combined the College of Environment Science and also the medical school because after SARS, you know, that's a very uh, uh, easy in a way. The second thing is the 2006, we established biomedical engineering in our new established engineering uh, school uh, together with Georgia Tech and Emory. And because Georgia Tech and Emory built up the uh, biomedical engineering in six years, they become number two in the United States. So now Peking University have that program too, just for your information. Yeah, I think that's very important because, I mean, I became convinced that in terms of educational interventions at, for new programs, particularly these interdisciplinary ones, it was going to have to happen at Beijing University, Tsinghua, the leading universities in China. We weren't going to be able to nucleate this at, 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 a, at a lower level. So it's that kind of leadership it's going to, in my mind, take to make the difference in the future. Yes. <laughs> Come on back. So I'm really grateful um, that all of you are addressing rural issues in this panel. It's near and dear to my heart. It's where I work in China. So I was hoping, um, Kirk, if you could explain a little bit more, given the, the reliance on biofuels in rural areas for both heating and cooking. And many of those are, are acquired essentially without cost by rural households, either through their additional agricultural waste or from mountain land that they have lease rights to that they're able to cut from in certain areas. How do we change what fuels are available to a rural population without putting an additional economic burden upon them? Good wake up call. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say um, not well known even in China is the fact that the Chinese um, government in uh, 1981 or so, embarked on, I think, fair to say, that one of the largest rural development projects in human history, affecting roughly a billion people, introducing 185 million improved stoves across China. Now, numbers have to be big to be, to be big in China, but even 185 million is a big number even in China. There are only 220 million rural households. So that was accomplished, uh, I mean, if you're interested, there's some reviews and things about how that was done. It wasn't, uh, wasn't easy. And they, it was a combination of technology, but also, uh, you might say, administrative and, um, uh, you know, logistics technology that put this in. 
the only government in the world that came close to doing anything. The, Chinese, the Indians tried to do it and didn't, didn't succeed. Now those um, stoves by today's standards are you know, poorly performing, they were good at the time. So the Chinese have shown that they've been able, and when they put their mind to it, they can actually accomplish something. And that was done through a combination, the actual amount of subsidy to, um, by the government in doing that was, well, my calculation was about 11%. And, um, you know, that still was a lot of money, it multiplied by 180 million, but if you look at the, the, uh, most, of the most of the cost was borne by the households. And um, what's needed now, where the argument that my, me and my colleagues are trying to make is that there's a set of modern technologies, high combustion uh, devices of various kinds, um, that uh, achieve much greater benefits, more energy efficiency, many fewer greenhouse gases and many fewer health damaging gases for devices that don't, don't cost you know, $15 like those stoves did, but maybe are $30 or $40 by moderns, you know, which is in rural China not out of the question. It might be difficult in parts of rural India, but in China there's, there is a bit of cash. But it requires, it's not so much the technology or the, you know, the engineering, it's the it's a sort of a, doing it in creative ways, creating incentives at the local level, creating you know, low interest loans, creating bridging the gap between the high energy, the high discount rates that the consumers have. It's the same kind of problem we have with appliances. I mean, Mark Levine and others who are working on consumers want paybacks in, you know, in, in what, four months or something. But the social payback you're happy with is, you know, on the order of two or three years. So you have to bridge that gap. And very little creative work has been done on this by scholars, by the government. The whole thing has been dropped entirely. And it's, I think, part of, as I mentioned, part of this sort of ignoring the rural areas or hoping that they're going to fix themselves in some fashion. But, um, but it's, you know, they're not going to fix themselves. Over time, maybe a lot of people move to urban areas, but that's the big movement to urban areas creating a lot of problems, too. If you made things more viable in rural areas, you'd slow that urbanization. And, of course, in the mean, in immediate decades, improve the quality of life for, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So there are technologies. There has been a history of success, but not that we know instantly exactly how, how to do it. I think, as I didn't get a chance to show those slides, but we've, we, we now work on the so-called co-benefits business in China, and that is the fact that if the Western world is going to be, well, at the moment, it's, you know, if the Belgians are going to pay a lot of money to reduce greenhouse gases through the Kyoto Protocol and the CDM mechanism, why not spend it first in places where you get a lot of other development benefits not that you're going to solve the world's problems by improving all the Chinese stoves, but if you're going to spend a lot of money first, why not do it in places where you get these huge other set of benefits? So trying to readjust the system, the world system, such that those carbon, that carbon, those carbon investments go first in places where you get serious development benefits. So we've, you know, we, we do calculate, we do measurements, we develop measurement systems, and we do, and and uh, I've got some students here helping us do this kind of thing to to actually try to show that you can get very cost-effective carbon savings by investing in rural energy in, in China, let's say, and cost-effective health improvements by comparison to what's available. So, but it's, it's, it's not easy. The, I mean, as Bob said, they're bureaucratic silos. The health ministry doesn't see it as what they do. The energy ministry doesn't see it what they do. The agricultural ministry used to handle this, but it's, its cloud is way down the list now. Um, the Agricultural Ministry did the Bruce Stowe program, but they're so far down the totem pole now that it's... Any case. Yes. In the back there. Oh, okay. No, that, there was a man in the back there. So, uh, was she ready? Oh, okay. I didn't know what she was walking in. Go ahead. Plenty. Sorry, okay, for go the ahead. past 20 years, I have worked uh, in an NGO in the United States and also in China. And uh, we have supported extensively the grassroots projects in the basic education and the primary health care and also environmental sound technologists. And uh, in the past 20 years, we have witnessed the tremendous impact of the environmental degradation in the rural area, especially the impact to the people which is 70% of the Chinese people living there. I think we need more attention 
to not only those kind of climate change to the world, and also especially to the people in China. Yeah, they are being completely neglected by the outside world, and there are many tremendous issues need to be addressed, need to be uh, pay attention, need to be research on. Yeah, so I'm just talking about this uh, huge area about the Chinese population in living in the rural area and being completely neglected. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Good statement. I guess. Good statement. Yes. yes. <laughs> Gentleman in the back there. It's kind of a quick question for Kirk Smith. Um, a lot of your research that you presented had to do with uh, the effects of coal usage, and um, pardon my being naive on this, but um, I did hear something on PBS about. Uh, China's coal being so-called dirty coal, and which would have this not process, therefore it has more particulates in it and things like that. Um, assuming this definition is correct, um, what would be the difference in your data? Well, um, I didn't, you know, have time to go through that. I mean, I actually consulted with them on that. I mean, there's a, there's a, in my mind, one of the biggest scandals in China and therefore in the world, China being such a big part of the world, is the fact that there are estimates vary, but probably at least 50 million, maybe 100 million people that are using what I can only call poisonous coals. These are coals that have all the nasty things of incomplete combustion, like um, any solid fuel burned in small devices, but also contain a lot of fluorine is the most uh, problematic, but also arsenic, lead, mercury, selenium, you name it. And there's an area that sort of cuts, a geological area that cuts across the swath of central China of what they call endemic counties. Um, these are counties where a, a large fraction of the population uses these poisonous coals. And a remarkable, um, you know, my colleagues in China, uh, remarkable things they find in terms of the impact on the population, you know, people with teeth falling out and their bodies contorted because of their skeletons have, um, you know, been malformed and, and on and on and on. And the fact, I mean, you know, this is a country that's building a skyscraper every two and a half seconds uh, on the eastern seaboard. Bullet trains, putting astronauts into orbit, landing robots on the moon, has a, you know, nuclear submarines and nuclear reactors, and it still has 100 million people burning poisonous coal in their households. You know, I don't think this is sustainable, let's put it that way. Um, and so that would be the first thing to work on. And that's our argument, actually, is on the coal, on the, is to work first in these endemic coal areas because you get the greenhouse benefits, you get this huge health benefit, and you know, get rid of this, this stuff. On the other hand, it's not easy. Why do people use these coals? Well, because there's a little coal mine locally, and they can just go get a wheelbarrow and you know, get it. So it, it, it's uh, not something that you, know, you, you write something down in Beijing that's gonna change. I mean, it's gonna take some serious work. And I think you can provide substitute fuels of some kind, and you're probably gonna have to put skull and crossbones on certain coal mines, like we do on certain water supplies. And that has, and then I was surprised we had a meeting on this recently, there, I guess about a year ago, and the troublesome thing is getting worse. Because, why is that? Because it used to be just the local coal mine, but now with the opening of the economy, some guy on a Saturday, he's got a, he rents a truck, fills it up with the local poisonous coal and drives it 300 kilometers somewhere to sell it. So you don't even, they're not even not able to keep track of it anymore, really, because it's you know it, it's it's getting into the system. So anyway, I mean it's a, it's a kind of a hobby horse of mine, but it, it is a, a very you know un, unsustainable, I think is the polite way to say it, um, situation. Yes. Up in the second row here. <laughs> Hi. I wanted to kind of follow up question on what you were just talking about. I understand that the central government in China has been talking a lot about developing uh, the rural areas and trying to rebalance the rural versus urban areas. And I'd just like to hear you talk a little bit about that given all the problems going on. Do you see this as substantial uh, or more um, sort of rhetoric from the government? 
Well, my colleagues might have something to say about this too, but um, well, no. yeah. Let me let me just begin and mm -hmm. say that in in the world I work in in Sichuan, uh, you do see this. You do see definite uh, improvements in the uh, villagers' environments. Uh, every time we come there, uh, there'll be uh, some of these biogas digesters that you didn't know were going in, or now they're installing uh, a, a wells that uh, for for a clean water supply. Uh, so yes, the, uh, I have seen it. You know, it's not hugely dramatic, but but it's certainly happening. And uh, every time you go, you run across another village with some sort of modest improvement that uh, is uh, clearly uh, associated with the, the fact there are greater resources in China available now, and they are they are finding they're, they're trickling down. Uh, to some degree, I have no notion about a metric that you could put on how much, but it's there's evidence in the world I, I work in. Peng, have you, you seen that as well? I'll just uh, comment uh, on, on uh, both sides about energy use, for example, in the rural area. I think there's one trend in China. It's uh, people migration into the townships and also to cities. So that actually um, reduced the energy consumption needs in the purely village level. Um, so I can give you an example that for uh, when I was young as a child to go to the villages and now I go to go back to revisit them in Shandong Peninsula, they are still using primarily um, the crop waste. So. Um, but there are lots of people moving out from the villages. Um, because of that, on the rural development side, actually, if you look at the rural development, who's going to get the good houses, you know, environmentally for their own small family household improvement? One, the local leaders, you know, we call Cun Zhang, to those who, who know Chinese, the head of the village. Second are those people who have young laborers going away in the cities. They work, they bring back money to build, improve their environment. Whether or not that's a good thing, actually, my study, I was trying to show that may not be a sustainable thing. You know, that requires policy uh, behind that to change it. But uh, that's the kind of trend. Yeah, I think from my perspective in this, um, you're right. That they, one of the two, two People's Congresses ago, I think they really focused on rural areas that recognized these inequities that were occurring, you know, officially. And um, he said such things even as, as, I, re as I remember, uh, that they would be willing to invest in rural areas and sacrifice overall GNP growth in the country, that uh, they abolished all income taxes in the rural areas first time in 5,000 years. So, you know, there was a big thing about that. All, um, so, but it hasn't been long enough really to see, in my, in the areas I work, I think in the overall numbers, although there, there are certainly some things happening, I mean, it's not just in energy or, you know, that realm. I mean, the, the whole healthcare system has come apart in rural areas. The whole barefoot doctor system is gone. There's no, the schools are in bad shape. I mean, it's, it's um, not just um, energy or even or environment related things. I mean, I think. I suppose from the health side, the biggest single problem is the lack of health care. And there's no insurance. You know, there's market-based things are moving in, but people don't have the resources. There's no clinics. They can't get the doctors out there. There's no insurance. Uh, it's not an area that I'm personally uh, expert in, but I certainly hear about it from my colleagues. So, um, but you're right. There has been an official notification, notice of it, and there are probably, you know, people much more familiar with the Chinese policies and government actions and how meaningful these statements are and how much resources have been put in. I'd be quite interested to know. Certainly the Ministry of Agriculture has had nothing in terms of an improved stove program, I can tell you that. Um, so in that particular one. On the other hand, there's a National Renewable Energy Plan now um, that includes a lot of different things. But what I've seen of it doesn't have much at the household level. But still it has wind and, you know, biomass, um, uh, gasification and a range of uh, important renewable energy activities. And they're putting in a tax on non-renewable electricity. What is it, one cent a kilowatt hour or something? Potentially huge amount of resources. Not enough really probably to affect demand much, but 
lot of things happening. You go, I mean, somebody said you've gone for two weeks and you come back and you know, it's a new world. Um, so, um, and, and some colleagues you know, trying to make some decisions. So maybe we'll see something. Okay. Mm. Well, quickly and then we'll, then we'll have one more question, okay? You, you want to say? all need to go back to China again and uh, soon. And uh, the reason because the China rule area and they are generated a lot of methane with the pig, with cow in Sichuan. I can show you at least 10. I can see you Guangzhou or Guangxi. You know, I personally visit all those places. They call little farm, recycle, organic, uh, organic farming and plus with the pig. And I can give you a dozen about those examples. But if you want to say they still have a poor area like Inner Mongolia, like Arda, and that's a deadly. You know, that's nobody lived there. And I think uh, uh, people and pick up the dirt to make, uh, make a living. There are very, very poor people. But as far as in the southwest, you have a uh, water area. And I think the rural energy development and also school system go along with it. And also some with the minority, I personally visit we have a lot of uh, conservation leadership training program in all different villages. And, uh, and uh, the it's, uh, situation is much different. But you are not able to solve 100 million people or everywhere. But it takes time. But I do see some signs. Oh, yeah. The reason because the, even, the, even the worker in Guangdong, you cannot find them. Now the price is a 20% increase. You know why? Because people go back to rural area. It's a, even the migration is, uh, is going on, but the still people go back to move the rural area. I do suggest some people go over there to take a visit and give an overview and give a more accurate and statement instead of a generalized just by one or two example. Well, you know, I've spent you know, many months in rural areas all over the country, and I can tell you it's not a common thing. Now, and it's not being done at the scale that the Chinese have shown themselves capable of doing 180 million improved stoves with a major activity. It's nothing, nothing like that is happening. Now, on, there are improvements in Sichuan, there are improvements here and there, particularly on the eastern co coast. I'm not talking about the eastern coast. I'm talking about, you don't have to go so far to go to the west, however, to get, you could just go to Hubei. Okay, uh, we, okay, you'll find, we have you'll find, you'll find, Tens of millions of households using fuels just like I showed you. Okay, one with no more. government program in, in sight to do anything about it. Okay, one uh, more, one more question. Last question. In the back there. Thank you. Um, my question is um, more about the effectiveness of um, environmental education in rural area. Uh, as a small nonprofit, we do a grassroots uh, development in rural China. We support a lot, um, uh, like the stoves, energy saving stoves in uh, Guizhou area. And we also did many uh, projects like biogas, um, small hydro. Um, like a power station. And also we did some uh, uh, environmental education like in migrant worker rural community and uh, in, um, in Guizhou and also in Beijing in migrant worker community. Um, our challenge is how we can combine um, like our environmental sound practices uh, applications and the um, environmental education like we plan to use the energy stove, we found it's very effective. Actually, in the villages, we implement that program. We, we, we basically need to have a lottery system. Um, so we're planning to get a fund to implement more stoves while combining like, um, environmental education. We found the need, we found the enthusiasm in local communities because they want to change the environment. In the past 20 years, that's the only thing they see uh, deterioration in rural community. You can see the garbage, you know, in the water, in the river, you know, along the roadside, you see the batteries. Everywhere you see the medical waste, you know, because that's the big concern. The only thing they could do is to, to burn it. So for us, you know, we are kind of trying to find the effective way to, to deliver that knowledge 
you know, it also for migrant worker community because they work in the dangerous uh, profession, like uh, recycling, and they didn't know all those uh, um, health hazards, you know, for their family and for themselves. We, we also, I want to echo to that gentleman's um, comment that we, we do see there's some young uh, migrant workers return to their uh, local communities. They want to build their local communities. Uh, we want to see how we can help them, how we can transfer our knowledge and our best practices just to be their partner to help them. So my question um, uh, to the panelist is, um, what, what's your comments and advice on how to per, uh, conduct um, the most effective uh, environmental um, education and uh, some applications? Thank you. Thank you. Would, would you like to field that one? Go ahead. Well, um, you know, I really appreciate your, your comment and effort. I think, uh, uh, to put it simple, we, uh, you know, uh, standing in your shoes, we're also thinking about similar ways to encourage young people to do that. I gave you one example why that motivated me so much to do something uh, like what you're doing is that uh, um, right now in the village that, that I visited in the hilly area in, in Shandong uh, Peninsula, that's a rich province in people's mind. But uh, people die at around 40 years of age. Yeah, so, those male labor doing the orchard garden work. So I went back and asked people why, you know, so many people, not everyone, right? So many people die at such a young age, male. They told me that uh, they get cancer. So what kind of cancer? Eventually they, they are mentioning that because they, every year they have so much time working in the garden, in, in the orchard. You know, apple in, in, in Shandong province is good product. See, so every eight days they do pesticide spray. Every eight days, that's what they were uh, advised to do that. So one thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, whether or not we should make up a program to train those people, you know, to help those people to not to believe those fertilizer sellers and also pesticide sellers that uh, you need to be applying those chemicals every eight days. You know, there are other reasons I can give you. So we are, one way that we are thinking about is to, you know, right now, China, it's like in, you know, we, we can talk about there's a voluntary type of system for people to go to the army. We could also make an environmental team, you know, for the young undergraduate who doesn't have work. This is institutional type of effort. For those young people who don't really have a decent job, for them to join this kind of environmental army for two years or three years, to go to the township level, to make every town in China to have an environmentalist, not agricultural extension specialist. We, we need that, but also have an environmentalist you know, to help those farmers in the rural areas on the, the kind of issues that uh, you are trying to raise. I think we can all think about ways to do that, I think education is a key, but institutionalization is a very important uh, mechanism to get it done. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panelists and... Ah. Right.